Thunderbirds are go! Welcome to another episode of Bar Moon Saturdays, and it's time to take a look at Thunderbirds are go! Only I wish they were going somewhere. This film just suffers from really bad pacing issues, like right out of the gate. It feels like they're trying to adapt, you know, a TV episode into a feature-length film. So, like, we got to throw in some padding wherever we can fit, you know, the meet our runtime requirement, you know, so we can get in theaters. That's what it feels like. And it's just, it's just a horrible idea. Like, find something else you can do with your film than just throw in needless filler, because... I realize, you know, on the big screen, you know, having a 10-minute sequence where you're assembling the Zero X and putting it together might seem grand and epic, especially if you got, you know, the big screen in front of you, you know, it's just filling up your entire visual range, and you got the music in the background, you know, making it seem like it's this grand, epic event, like the one of the most important moments in human history, you know, is taking place right before your eyes as they assemble the Zero X on the runway and prepare to lift off on their journey to Mars. But on a small screen, it's just unbelievably tedious and boring. Because you're like, can we please get on with it? Like, we're spending ten minutes just watching them put a model together. <sighs> and it's just not very exciting to watch. You know, visually, it's like watching paint dry. And it's not a fun experience. It's sort of like sitting around playing a game for hours on end, you know, just grinding. Or competing in the Altador Cup. You know, it gets boring fast. You sort of just got push your way through it, rather than enjoy it. Um, so, yeah, that's right, in the, right at the beginning, you know, we got that issue. Then, you know, we realize that we don't even meet our title characters until about the 20-minute mark in this film. So, yeah, we don't meet the Thunderbirds until about 20 minutes into a movie titled Thunderbirds Are Go! Like, where are the Thunderbirds at? Like, they hardly in this film practically, it feels like. And that's a bad sign, ain't it? Uh Another padding scene we have happens around the midway mark, I suppose, where we have a dream sequence with Alan, who I guess is meant to be like our main character, who constantly writes about how you know he has to stay home and man the base while his older siblings are out partying, you know, at nightclubs and whatnot with Penelope, because he'd rather be dating Penelope, but you know he's stuck on base, you know, because he has to be there in case there's an emergency, you know, because he's the responsible adult, despite you know everyone treating him like a kid. So, you know, got got that going on, too. Because uh, you always love when you have a penchulant, you know, child on screen, right? Uh. But, yeah, that entire sequence, you know, even throws in a musical number from a band from the 60s whose name I don't really remember at the moment because even though I was reading through reviews, you know, it's just information I just don't care to remember, you know, because how often am I going to go back and watch, you know, bands from the 60s? Unless it's, you know, my dad's favorite band. Because he actually took me to one of their concerts one time. But at least, you know, I can be like, oh, Poco. Like, that's my dad's favorite band. And I looked him up for a research project for a music class one time, too. For a quick, you know, sign with a knockout. Original name was Pogo until they were sued, actually. By a political comic. And they obviously lost and changed their name by one letter. You know, just to be like, yeah, well... We can change it real easy. We'll switch the G to a C. There, completely different name now. Now we sound like the name of a dog. Because that's what my dad named his Pomeranian back in the day. I know, we're going on a tangent, but I'd rather talk about that stuff than talk about Thunderbirds. Ah, oh, go! <sighs> After we get done with the dream sequence, we then have a few other scenes that really don't add much. But we then get to another, like, padding scene where we get to see the... the people that were in the Zero X, you know, on Mars, and they're exploring, and they run into rock monsters that can shoot fireballs. And don't ask me how the fireballs work, or why Mars, you know, isn't red. Seriously, like, Mars should be, be the red planet. We can tell, you know, from Earth it's a red planet. So why in this film does it look more like the moon or something? And why are there rock snakes on it that can shoot fireballs? I mean, I get it's life as we don't know it, but that's not that interesting of a bit. And it doesn't really go anywhere since, you know, it doesn't damage the spacecraft directly, so it leads into the final sequence where, you know, we gotta have the big rescue operation. Though I suppose that may have been the implication, but... Ugh, I, I guess maybe that's how they tried to connect it, but it doesn't seem obvious enough. Because I've seen plenty of people complain about it. Ugh. So yeah, we got a scene on Mars that's just weird, boring, it makes no sense because they comment on the thinness of the atmosphere, so how are they shooting fireballs? Let's just move on. Yeah. 
So we don't get anything really impressive to like the um, end explosion at the end of the film. It's just, like that's just not enough to maintain my interest. Even for a film that was two dollars, this was disappointing. Yes, I got this for two bucks. Uh, feels like I wasted my two dollars. Oh well, it's just another one to throw in the collection, I suppose. But yeah, I'd say I'm um, just skip this. I mean, maybe if you uh, have childhood nostalgia for the Thunderbirds, you might get more out of this. But if you don't know anything about the series, stay away from it because this is definitely not the way you want to be introduced to the series. Till next time, then. See ya.